The plasma membrane or cell membrane is not a rigid structure. It's sort of a fluid mixture of lipids and proteins. It's constantly moving and changing and it has a really important role and the biggest thing that that cell membrane does is regulate what gets in and out of the cell by keeping the intracellular fluid and the extracellular fluid separate. It provides a physical barrier that controls what gets in and out. So we say that it is selectively permeable in the way that it regulates that in and out of the cell. Things have to be able to get into cells. I mean, if cells are going to make ATP, we got to get them glucose, right? But then waste products are being created. We have to get rid of them. But it's not just that. There are a lot of things that have to get in and out of cells. Nutrients, ions, waste molecules. We make proteins inside cells that have to get out of the cell. So selectively permeable refers to how things move or how they are excluded from moving across the membrane. The third bullet that you see down there, electrochemical gradients, we're going to talk a lot about that later in the chapter when we look at electrochemical gradients. Now in a, one of our previous lectures, we mem uh, I'm sorry, we mentioned that gradient means there's more of something on one side of something than there is on the other. So for instance, if we have a coffee filter um, and the water hasn't started running through it yet and all that is in the filter are the coffee grounds. Well, there's a gradient because all of the grounds are on one side of the filter. Now we don't want them to go on the other side so it would be selectively permeable in not allowing the coffee grounds to go through. But what does go through? Uh-huh, the water, right? So the water can go through, the coffee grounds can't. That's an example of selectively permeable. Now let's think about that gradient or difference on each side of the membrane. Electrochemical refers that there are chemicals that have electrical charges, and you know, we've seen some of this stuff like our ions, but there are other things as well. So we're not just talking about just the charges, we're talking about chemicals and electrical charges that are different on each side of the membrane. That's going to be really important for the cell doing its job. And then cells also have receptors that allow them to recognize other cells, but also to respond to molecular signals from other cells as well. Now before we look at the image here on the left, let's take a quick look at this cell membrane, our little piece of cell membrane in the image on the right. So I've mentioned previously that the cell membranes are made of a phospholipid bilayer. Now we're going to examine that in great detail. So here's the phospholipid bilayer. This is inside the cell down here in the blue. This tan color up here is outside the cell. So inside the cell we have the cytosol which is the intracellular fluid. Outside of the cell, we have the interstitial fluid, which we call tissue fluid. The interstitial fluid is the extracellular fluid. Intra means within, extra means outside of. Okay, now let's look at the picture on the left side of the screen. So this sort of dark brownish purple you see right here, this is one cell membrane and this one is another cell membrane. So we have two cell membranes here, so that tells us there's a cell here, and there's a cell here, and this is the membrane, and this is the membrane. So the space between them where you see this sort of tan color, that's the same thing you see over here in the tan color. That's the interstitial fluid, or the tissue fluid that fills the spaces between cells. As we start looking at the actual structure of that cell membrane, let's review what these phospholipids are and what they look like. We've talked about this previously, but not in great detail. So the cell membrane or plasma membrane, PM, because plasma membrane, you know, I get tired of typing that out 8,000 times. The plasma membrane is a phospholipid bilayer. Now what does that mean? Phospholipid means a lipid which is fat, right, 
a lipid with a phosphate attached. Bilayer means there are two layers of phospholipids. Now, if you look at a representation of a phospholipid bilayer, it looks sort of like you've got two layers of balloons, and each balloon has two strings attached to it. Okay? So the balloon heads are the phos or the balloons in the analogy there would be the phosphate heads. Phosphates are polar. So the phosphate heads, the little blue balls you see here, are polar. That means they're charged. And remember, polar loves water. So these are polar heads that are hydrophilic, water-loving. The two nonpolar tails, nonpolar means they're not charged. Okay, so these are hydrophobic, water-fearing. So notice the nonpolar tails come together and hide between the phosphate heads so they don't have to interact with the water. Remember, they're water-fearing. Now, this prevents the lipids in the outermost part of the membrane from flipping to the innermost part of the membrane and vice versa because those polar t or those nonpolar tails, they're not going to move and be next to the water. They're going to stay in the middle away from it. In addition to the phospholipids, we also have cholesterol molecules that are scattered throughout the cell membrane. These cholesterol molecules strengthen the membrane and stabilize it uh, against extreme temperatures. Glycolipids, think about the word, glyco, sugar, lipid, fat. So glycolipids are lipids with a carbohydrate or a sugar attached. These extend only toward the outer part of the cell membrane, so they're exposed up here to the extracellular fluid. Remember, that's your interstitial fluid. Now, these are sort of like, and I like the way your book describes them, they're like little antennas sticking off the uh, lipids or the proteins. So this is a glycoprotein, sugar attached to a protein. Here we've got a glycolipid, sugar attached to a lipid. Now, you can't see it in this image, but how this uh, little uh, little line right here is showing you that we're going to name these things. So all of these lipids extending from the proteins and, or all of these sugars, excuse me, extending from the proteins and the lipids, these form an outer coating called a glycocalyx. Now, it doesn't really cover the entire cell membrane, but because they stick up from the cell membrane, we call them the glycocalyx, sugar coat. Because proteins are much heavier than lipids, they make up about half the weight of a cell membrane, but that doesn't mean there's an equal number of proteins and lipids. Remember, proteins are very heavy. Now, these proteins, they're not stabilized within the membrane. They float and move around, sort of like a beach ball in a swimming pool. It's constantly moving. These are responsible for a lot of the functions of what that membrane is going to do. Now, we're going to look at all of these individually, but all of the membrane proteins fall into one of two categories, integral or peripheral. Integral proteins are sometimes called transmembrane proteins. Trans means across. So they run all the way across the membrane. So you can see here, this is an integral protein. Here is an integral protein. It's inside, outside, and all the way through. Periphery means on the side or the edge. So peripheral proteins are only found on the inside of the cell membrane or just on the outside of the cell membrane. And here again, you can see the same thing. Of course, I've already talked about this. So there's a transmembrane or integral protein. There's an integral protein. Here's a peripheral protein, okay? And of course, also here you can see that glycocalyx. So the glycocalyx, remember, is just formed by the sugars that are attached to the lipids or the proteins on the outside of the cell membrane. On the next few slides, we're going to do sort of an overview 
of the proteins that are found within the cell membranes. Now, you're learning just the basics about these now, but we'll continue to talk about them as we talk about muscle contraction with sodium-potassium pumps, which are some of these transport proteins. And we'll learn about it when we talk about uh, neurotransmitters binding to receptors. You'll talk about them continuing into the next semester when you have... Um, more of the pumps and proteins that are going to be responsible for allowing things to move in and out of cells to help regulate blood pressure or to cause the heart muscle to contract. So we're just going to overview these now. So your transport proteins, of course, are going to regulate movement across the cell membrane. They include channels and carriers and others such as pumps. So a channel is just something that's open, okay? So things are going to move from where there's more to where there's less simply because you've got an open channel for them to move through. A carrier protein is going to bind a hold of something or sort of get that attachment. So we've got little green molecules. That's probably a glucose there, okay? So the little green molecules, there's more of them outside than inside. So the little green molecules will attach to the carrier. And then it's sort of like putting a key in a lock. It's going to change shapes a little bit, open up, and the little green hexagon falls into the cell. Pumps are going to actively move things in and out. So instead of moving from where there's more to where there's less, pumps will usually do it opposite. Move things from where there's less to where there's more. Sort of like when you're pumping water out of your boat to keep it from sinking. You want to go from where there's less water in your boat and put that water back in the ocean where there's more. Whoa. All right, continuing with our proteins, cell surface receptors are going to bind to something. So they're going to bind to specific molecules called ligands. So ligands bind to macromolecules like this big protein, which is a receptor. An example of a ligand is the neurotransmitter acetylcholine. So nerve cells release acetylcholine. It binds to, so the ligand would be the acetylcholine. It binds to the protein receptor on a muscle cell, and that's going to be what triggers that muscle cell to contract. So it is a cell surface receptor protein. Identity marker proteins typically will have uh, the sugar attached to them, so it would be a glycoprotein making up part of that glycocalyx. Now, those identity markers are going to help your immune system to recognize, hey, this cell belongs to me. It's healthy. It's good. It's mine. Don't kill it. Your immune system is responsible for protecting you, so when it recognizes something that's not yours, it's going to mount an attack. So your identity marker cells help your immune system to know whether or not that particular cell that has that particular protein belongs to you, and if not, let's kill it. Remember we talked about enzymes in our previous chapter. So enzymes are proteins that are embedded in the cell membrane. They can either be on the internal or external surface of a cell, and they're going to catalyze the chemical reactions that happen within them. Anchoring proteins are going to secure the cytoskeleton, so the internal and the internal protein support of a cell. It's going to anchor that cytoskeleton to the cell membrane. Well, you know, it's sort of like your skeleton inside your body, right? It's anchored to the rest of your body. And then we have cell adhesion proteins, which form cell to cell attachments. So proteins that form membrane junctions. Now we're going to have several different types of these that we'll see, but one of the main things that these do is to bind one cell to another. As you see here in this image, these two are adhesion proteins, linker proteins. They bind one cell membrane to another. And here, of course, you can see the cytoskeleton filaments anchored to the cell membrane through that anchoring protein. All right, just a little summary and reminder here. The plasma membrane is the same thing as the cell membrane. It provides a physical barrier between the intracellular fluid and the extracellular fluid, and it is selectively permeable, meaning some things can pass and some things don't.
So it is permeable to small, nonpolar, uncharged, or lipid-soluble molecules. They can move across the cell membrane. Integral proteins assist the polar and charged molecules to get across, and big macromolecules, we have to put them in a container called a vesicle, which is made up of cell membrane, and that allows us to move big things in and out of the cell. So we'll continue to talk about this. Remember also the cell membrane helps us to maintain that electrochemical gradient and communicate with neighboring cells. Remember, one of the main things that the plasma membrane is supposed to do is be a barrier to prevent excess loss or gain of things in and out of the cell. When a patient has a severe burn, obviously cell membranes have been destroyed, others have been compromised. This allows things to move very freely in and out of the cell. Well, that compromises the concentration gradients that should be across cell membranes. This, in turn, can exacerbate or enhance the loss of those fluids, but also proteins and ions that can weep from those damaged cells. A very effective treatment is to use human amniotic membranes. The amniotic membrane is what forms the bag of water in a pregnant woman. So these have shown to help reduce bacterial infection, uh, help to uh, make the pain and itching a bit more manageable to shorten the healing times, reduce the inflammatory response, help to control water loss, help to prevent scar formation, and help to promote the replacement of those tissues with new epithelial tissues.